the a commentary on the book, it's made up or comp comprised of over 40 different explanations of the book. So it's a book on the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, mm -hmm. the description, the character, mm -hmm. and we add to the class another aspect, inshallah. Now, who is the author of this book? This is Shama' al Muhammadiyah. The author of this book is Abu Isa Muhammad ibn Isa al Tirmidhi. Anyone ever heard that name before? Al Tirmidhi? Okay. He was born in the year 201 after Hijrah. About 200 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad. And he was born in an area called Khurasan. In an area called Khurasan. What is Khurasan? Where is that area? It's modern day. So, so Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and part of Iran. And I have a picture here of the map. Everything in orange was considered Khurasan. What do we know about that area that's very unique? Who else came from that area? Let's listen to these names. Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam, so Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Ibn al-Hajjaj, and Naysaburi, who else? Imam Abu Dawood, al-Sajistani, Imam al-Nasahi, Imam al-Tirmidhi, Imam ibn Majah, what's left? Who are these, who are these names? Who is that? These are the, from the greatest scholars of hadith. We just named the six from the most popular, maybe. The six books of hadith, all from this area here. What does that indicate? What, what, what's, what's, what, you know, why are we mentioning that? That the six most famous, you could say, Al-Kutub al-Sitta, the six most famous books of hadith, they are all coming from this area marked in the orange map. What does that indicate here? What's, what's so important about that? Yeah, Ibrahim? That this land is not even a land of the Arabs. And that's powerful. That this deen, the science of hadith, the preservation of the sunnah, Allah Azza wa Jal enabled it to be done by people who are not even of the Arabs. By people who didn't even speak the Arabic language as their first language. And yet, the deen was preserved. The sunnah was preserved. So this is also a little bit of a sign for you and I, for each and every one of us, that this deen is not for a certain country or a group of people, or this is for them, somebody else will do it. No, no, it's upon each and every one of us to read, to study, to try to seek knowledge, to understand, to teach, because here we see that the biggest of scholars came from the land of the non-Arabs. Who were his teachers, Imam al-Tirmidhi? Who were his teachers? From them Imam al-Bukhari, from them Imam Muslim, from them Abu Dawood. Imam al-Bukhari said about Imam al-Tirmidhi, although he was a student, I have benefited from you more than you benefited from me. And Imam Bukhari narrated one hadith from Imam Al-Tirmidhi. And this was considered a great honor. That Imam Bukhari narrated one hadith from his student, and Imam Al-Tirmidhi. What are some of his famous works? Some of the most famous books that Imam Al-Tirmidhi authored? Of course, Al-Jama, his collection of hadith. Of course, many, many books. But from them, this book that we have here. This book that we're going over here, Imam Al-Mubarak Furi said, it's the best of books ever authored, full of barakah. Full of blessing. Why is that so? Why do you think that's so? The best of books ever authored, full of barakah. Why? Because? Because of the content. Because of what it's talking about. Imam al-Tirmidhi gathered 415 ahadith, and his goal was to gather every hadith that has to do with a physical description, a character of the Prophet Muhammad a manner that he had, the way he lived his life, the way he slept, the way he walked, the way he ate, the way, everything that he did, every way that he looked, he wanted to gather that. So because of the content of the subject, he said it's from the best of books ever authored, and it's full of barakah. His intelligence, a, 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 you know, unbel when we read the stories of the ulama and their intelligence, it's almost unbelievable. Imam al very quickly, Imam al Dhabi narrates about Imam al tirmidhi that he said about himself, that while to show you how sharp he was, that one time he was traveling with one of his teachers, a scholar, and the teacher narrated to him a few chapters of a hadith. And Imam al-Tirmidhi wrote them all down. So the next time he met his teacher, 
He pulled out his papers and his teacher said, recite to me the ahadith that you have. He, to verify they were written correctly. He pulled out his papers, he said about himself, and he realized the papers were blank. He had the wrong papers with him. So he started trying to recall the hadith. The teacher noticed and he said, you have no shame. You're coming to me. You want more hadith. You want me to narrate more to you. And you're coming with blank papers. You don't even have the wajib, the homework from the last time. So Imam al-Tirmidhi assured him that I have all of those hadith memorized word for word. And he recalled him without making a single mistake. To the point the teacher couldn't even, he didn't even believe it. The teacher said, no, some, you must have reviewed them before. So the teacher narrated to him, he said about himself, he narrated to me 40 ahadith with their chains of narration. And he said, recall them back to me. So he said, I was able to recall another 40 ahadith with their chains without making a single letter wrong, without a single mistake. So this shows you the intelligence of these ulama, these scholars, the ability that Allah Azza wa blessed them with. Now, the outline of this book here, there's some people in the outline of this book is that Imam al-Tirmidhi divided the book into two main aspects. The shama'al al-khalqiyya, the description of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, how he looked, how he dressed, how he walked, how everything that has to do with his creation, the khalq. And al-khulqiyya, everything that had to do with his character, his personality, his manners, his etiquette. And we'll add to that the khasais the specific qualities unique to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What differentiates the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the rest of the Prophets, from us as an Ummah? What are the signs that he was an actual Prophet before Prophethood, after Prophethood? We'll add that chapter to the, to the class inshaAllah. Now why this class? Why do we take our time going over this book here? What's the point? Why from the many sciences that we have, fiqh and tafsir, hadith, other books of hadith, why this book right here? So first and foremost, we claim that the Prophet Muhammad is our ultimate role model, right? We say that he is our ultimate role model. He is our guide. We claim that and we make the, the claim proudly that Allah Azza wa Jal swore by the Prophet Muhammad in the Qur'an and mentioned and took an oath by his great exalted standard of character. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are upon an exalted standard of character. You have the greatest of manners. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Qur'an, in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you have what? Uswatun Hasana. You have the most perfect of examples to follow if you hope for a good meeting with Allah on the last day. So if we have that perfect example, then what's wajib on us? To understand it, to study it, to know about it. And this was the methodology of the Sahaba. They wanted to know every detail of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu They wanted to know exactly how he lived his life. They wanted to know what he did behind closed doors, what he did in the middle of the night, what he did when he woke up. Look at Ibn Abbas who said, I wanted to, when he was a little kid, look at the methodology of even the children. I wanted to more or less spy on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and understand what his night worship was like. So I sought permission from my aunt Maimuna. Ibn Masood, I'm sorry. I sought permission from my aunt Maimuna to spend the night there. And I spent the night and I was watching the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every aspect of his sleep until I saw him wake up and I saw him wipe his face. And he began reciting some ayat from the Qur'an. Then he took some water and made wudu. And then he started praying the night prayer. And I went, I joined in with him. We know the long narration, the famous story. I joined in. All of this was why? Because he wanted just to understand how the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam lived his life at night. How he worshipped at night. Ibn Umar would go and seek the places the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam used the bathroom. He wanted to use the bathroom in those very same places. Because their goal, their desire was to do exactly as he did in his worship, in his day-to-day -day practice, in his business, with his family. They used to say, if you want your wife to be like Khadija, then you be like who? Then you better be led, ready to be like Muhammad Wasallam. So that was their goal. Their goal was to emulate every aspect of his life. Secondly, it's from the pillars of our Iman. It's from the pillars of our Iman to love the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. 
It's from the pillars of our faith. We are not complete believers. لا يؤمن أحدكم Until what? None of you will truly believe. حتى أكون أحب إليه Until I am more beloved to him. من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين you're not going to be a true believer until I'm more beloved to you, he said, وسلم, than your children, than your parents, and than all of mankind. Someone might ask why. Even Umar himself, when this was said, Umar, in the, you know, in the narrative story that we all know, he came to Rasulullah. I love you more than my children. I love you more than my parents. I love you more than everything, except for myself. I don't love you more than, meaning, I don't, care about you more than my own self. Naturally, I'm more concerned with my own well-being, even over yours. Is that a problem? What was the response? No, 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 Omar. حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ نَفْسِكَ Until I am more beloved to you than even your own self, you're not a complete believer. And then Omar finally reached that point. He said, الآن يا رسول الله. Now I get it. Now you are more beloved to me than even my own self. But the question, why? Why do we have to love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu more than everything and anything in the dunya? Why? Our own children, our own parents, all of mankind? What's the reason? Hamza? Because what he did for us. As Shaykh al-Islam said, love, it's a feeling that you give based on an exchange usually. Someone blesses you, someone honors you, someone takes care of you, your parents nourish you and they raise you and they sat, so you love them. And the stronger that blessing and that exchange, the more love you have. So he said, who has given us more? Who has sacrificed more? Who has done more for us and our well-being in the dunya and the akhirah than the Prophet Muhammad Through the Prophet Muhammad, he said, we, we attain our eternal happiness. Guidance, Iman, Islam, Paradise, through his following him and through his teachings and through their dedication and sacrifice. So for that reason, we must love the Prophet Muhammad more than anything and everything. Thirdly, the more we know, the more we know the Prophet Muhammad the stronger our, our love is. Isn't that right? What did the Prophet Muhammad say to someone who wanted to get married? Go, look at the person. See the person, because it's more likely that there will be stronger love. So the more that we know about the Prophet Muhammad the more that we understand about his character and his manners and his kindness and generosity and compassion with the children and treatment of family and dedication and general, whatever it might be, the more naturally our love will increase. And finally, in the life of the Prophet Muhammad is true guidance. Everything he did was perfection. It was uswatun hasana. It was true guidance. Look what Sufyan ibn Uyina said. He said, the Messenger of Allah is the greatest example of perfect balance. Whatever complies with his conduct and his character and his guidance is truth. And whatever goes against that is falsehood. Anything that goes against the Prophet Muhammad his character, his conduct, his guidance, you know right away it's falsehood. We don't need to wait for science to tell us. We don't need to wait for something else to prove. No, we know right away. If it's in the sunnah, if it was part of his life, there's khair in it. There's goodness in it. And even now, slowly, science begins to prove. Many things that you come, you read, you come across that, oh, subhanAllah, that's already been proven in the sunnah. If we just follow the sunnah, we have enough. We have enough guidance. They say sleep on your right side because it's better for your internal organs. And they say give the baby a little bit of sugar at birth. It will prevent brain defects. And they say make sure you dust out the bed because that there's dust mites that are now microscopic that you can't even see that reside on the surface. We have in the sunnah, if we truly implement the sunnah, the prophetic diet, the prophetic way of life, we have the answer to everything. We have complete perfection. We have the absolute truth. So it's wajib on us to know it, to study it, and to implement it. Going on. What are the signs to know that someone loves the Prophet Muhammad Before we begin the description, what are the signs to know whether or not we love the Prophet Muhammad The scholars say there are signs there to know that whether or not you are somebody who truly does love the Prophet Muhammad and has mastered this quality. 
Number one, ask yourself, how much do I copy and emulate the Prophet Muhammad When I compare my life to his life, my character to his character, my manners to his manners, my treatment of my family to the treatment, the way he treated his family, the way I am with children, the way he was with children, his generosity, my generosity, the way he looked even physically, the way he worshipped. How close are we? Is there a huge gap? If Anas ibn Malik said to a time that was close after the Sahaba and the Prophet Muhammad if the Prophet Muhammad would see you now, he wouldn't recognize anything of you except for the Salah. That's the only thing left. And that was at a time of who? Of the Tabi'een. So how about now in our day and time? How close are we to emulating and to copying the Prophet Muhammad Number two, loving what he loves. Once we learn what the Prophet Muhammad loved, he loved fasting and he loved Qiyamul Layl, he loved wearing white clothing and he loved generosity and he loved being kind. Once we learn these qualities, if we love them and we act upon them, that's a sign that we truly love the Prophet Muhammad Number three, loving everything that he was sent with. And this is a problem for some people. Well, you know, I agree with this, but that's not for me. Everything in the deen is perfect, but this aspect, no, I don't under that, that one doesn't make any sense. That one is not applicable for our day and time. No, no, from the sign that we love the Prophet Muhammad is we love everything that he was sent with. We love everything that the Quran brought, that the Sunnah brought, whether we understand it or not. What did Umar say when he went to the black stone? And Umar was a firm man, a man of strong aqidah. What did he say? Wallahi inni la a'lamu innaka hajarun la tadurru wa la tanfa. I know, Wallahi, you're nothing more than a stone. You can't harm me, you can't benefit me. Had I not seen the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Look, he's having a conversation with a rock. Had I not seen the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi kiss you, I would never kiss you. I would have never done it. I'm only doing it because it's the Sunnah. Whether I understand it or not, whether it makes sense to me or not, whether that's the methodology of the Sahaba. We heard many times before, they would hear sometimes, read, Ij this. And they would sit where they were randomly in the middle of the road. A man came to the Prophet Muhammad and took a ring off of his finger. He was wearing a golden ring. And he said, this will lead you to having coal or fire on your fingers in the hellfire. So the Prophet Muhammad took it and threw the ring. The Sahaba said, are you going to pick it up? Are you going to sell it? Are you going to... He said, wallahi, I'll never touch that ring. After the Prophet Muhammad took it and threw it off of my hand. So we have to love the Qur'an, love the Sunnah, love everything that it brought, whether we understand it, whether it makes sense, whether we're upon it right now or not, we still love it in our heart. And number five, always trying to send our salah, our salam on the Prophet Muhammad This is something that we fall short in. The Prophet Muhammad, there's great virtue, sallallahu saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi salatu wa sallam, salli ala Muhammad wa whatever it might be. Whoever sends the peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallam, one time, what's the reward of that? Allah will send prayer upon him ten times. And what is the prayer of Allah? Some people say it's mercy, right? No, no, no. Something even beyond mercy. Why? They are going to have prayer from their Lord upon them and mercy. It's something beyond mercy. It's something of praise and of blessing and of guidance and of nur that we can't even comprehend when Allah Azza wa sends His blessings and His salawat upon somebody. So we're making sure that we do that, that's part of our life. The Prophet Muhammad said to him, don't be stingy. He said even one time during Jummah khutbah, Ameen, may the one who hears my name and doesn't send peace and blessings upon me, may he be kept far away from the mercy of Allah. He said, Ameen. Jibreel made that dua. So making sure we're always saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And number six, studying and remembering his life. What do we know about the seerah? What do we know about the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What do our children know? You know, we hear the examples a lot. They know every character and every game and every athlete and every movie star. But what do they know about the seerah? What do they know about the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? His daily habits, his manners, his clothing, his appearance. How will they recognize the Prophet Muhammad in a dream? What do they know about his lifestyle? What do they know about his... If they don't know this, if we're not teaching and studying and always talking about it, what do we expect for the next generation in terms of sunnah and following that guidance?
So we'll stop there, inshallah, with, a, with an intro. I don't want to drag it on too long. We'll stop at this point and we'll continue, inshallah, every Wednesday after Aisha. We'll try to go for 20 minutes or, or so, taking a few chapters from the book. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashidu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu